نوت يا الله تمام خلينا نعطي كابل اوف سكند تو بيبل جوين اند نو ذات وي ار لايف اي ويل سند ان اناونسمنت اوكي انا رامي ام ويتنج فور يور كيو تيل مي وين ايفر تو ستارت انا بقول لك على طول ممتاز Rami, by the time they join, what is the preference? Arabic or English or both? Or? Uh, so most of them, yeah, if you, if you English, uh, yeah, most of them is English. Okay, I'll, I'll stick to English. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah hi, Balashwa. Hassan, okay. Pass. Okay, let me give another one more second so we can also start thinking. طيب. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rami, uh, for joining us. It's our pleasure to have you. Uh, and uh, it's a great effort, really, uh, to see you, uh, see your contributions, and hear from your insight and from your experience in the domain of the fintech and more than of this. Uh, I, I don't want to say more, uh, so you can take the mic and start. And we are... Uh, Happy to, uh, to hear from you, inshallah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I'm uh, really pleased and honored, actually humbled, to join such an amazing crowd of speakers and uh, attendees at the Arab MTech and Startup uh, Startups Conference. Um, just allow me, guys, a few seconds to share my screen so that we can kick off the uh, presentation. Okay, today uh, the title of this session is called The Future of Banking and Banks, and I'll focus a bit more on, uh, within the scope towards the end, on a solution called Enamine, which is the first Arab artificial intelligence and blockchain-based customer identity and uh, verification platform, also known as EKYC as a service, or the electronic uh, Know Your Customer, KYC, Know Your Customer as a service. I will be talking about this in details towards the end, but we will start with a bit on the future of banking and banks and uh, where uh, this is heading. Uh, the structure of the presentation is mainly three components. One is I would be talking a bit about my background, two about the thought process within the future of banking and three on uh, and I mean, and of course we'd be, uh, hopefully we'll have some time to take some questions uh, if needed. I will focus, I will try my best to go through the slides initially and then allocate some time for the Q&A just for everyone to be, uh, so that we gauge uh, expectations, uh, questions, please keep them towards the end. So initially, uh, let's start by introductions. My name is Rami al I'm uh, known to be someone who does not respond to his phone uh, for phone calls, but uh, using text, I'm the fastest uh, uh, in terms of responses. I'm uh, easily accessible through digital channels. I'm known as uh, El Kermi on Facebook and Instagram, and you can reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn as uh, Rami El Kermi. Um, this slide, I use it, and you'll see it more than once during this presentation, and I will be using it. Uh, I started my first presentation uh, regarding the future and what's going on with this slide maybe seven years ago and I keep using it in every presentation I go because it's part of my motto just because it worked in the past does not mean we don't disrupt it or we don't change it. Uh, by quick introduction of the things that I do I'm currently the uh, chief innovation officer of Jordan Ahli Bank which is the first Jordanian bank to be registered in Jordan uh, 65 years old next year we will be celebrating our 65th uh, anniversary and uh, uh, four years ago I joined uh, Jordan Ahli Bank as a, as a senior vice president and chief innovation officer of the bank which technically made me the first chief innovation officer in a bank in Jordan this uh, title requires central bank uh, the central bank of Jordan's approval and I was the first 
to receive this uh, approval as a, as a chief innovation officer. I also co-founded a company called Ahli Fintech, fully owned by the bank, to become the first fintech company owned by a bank in the Middle East and running the first uh, fintech accelerator uh, in the region. I'm also a member of the group within NASA called the Cross Industry Innovation Group. I'll be talking about this in a bit. And I'm a, a board member at uh, Ra'ad Arabi School, which is a, the school that I graduated from. I'm, an, I'm a Ra'ad Arabi alumni. So I was called back uh, to join the, the board of the school. And I'm uh, the guardian of the strategy committee within, within the school. I'm also a member of the Unreasonable Future uh, Mentors Group and uh, an investor with, uh, with Unreason Unreasonable Group. And I sit on the advisory board of FinTech Galaxy, uh, Think Barter Network, and uh, Roybe uh, AI Robots. Another point of caution is I'm a, I'm a Gemini. Uh, there's an evil twin, which I tried to suppress. But uh, it's, uh, I, I, for, a, for a while, I thought being a Gemini was a bad thing, especially when the evil uh, twin comes out, until I watched the Joker movie. And this made me clearly understand how uh, maybe the disruption is a form of uh, a, a gene required by Geminis. And uh, just out of uh, disclosure, the picture you see, I don't wear makeup. I've never wore makeup. This is a, a, an AI effect called the neural style transfer. And I love using this analogy every time we look into uh, business models and business model innovation, because the neural style transfer, transfer in artificial intelligence is based on uh, having uh, two images and then coming up with a morph between them. And this is mostly what happens when you uh, mm. try to innovate around uh, cross-industry innovation. And you will see across the examples, I will walk you through uh, how uh, different industries can borrow uh, business model patterns and business model innovation patterns uh, into each other. I run a, a, an amazing uh, innovation and fintech team at the bank, amazing group of individuals. They say hi. I always bring them with me to all of my meetings. And this is the crazy bunch I work with every day to make sure we are disrupting uh, the fintech space and the banking space. So uh, four years ago, I received this invitation to attend uh, an event at NASA called the Cross Industry Innovation Summit, which within those four years uh, developed into something called the Cross Industry Innovation Group, whereby uh, we are a group of hand-picked uh, innovation executives, be it chief innovation officers, VP of innovation, and what have you, across many, many industries. So this group includes uh, chief innovations from uh, the Daimler, Mercedes, Google, Microsoft, Tesla, whatever you can think of, the top industry uh, entities in the world, the chief innovations of them got a special invitation to attend those uh, special uh, uh, invite-only events at NASA. And what we do is, uh, apart from getting a special VIP trip at NASA headquarters and uh, NASA facilities, we sit together and uh, present, each of us presents something we call the Innovation X Talks, which is a TED-like talk focused on what we disrupted and what innovation models we and patterns we implemented within our industry, hoping that together we can share those, uh, this type of knowledge and uh, exchange uh, points of view and maybe borrow certain innovation patterns from a certain industry into another industry. And of course, NASA, the guardian of the conference or the, the group, uh, gets to see all this uh, innovation being brewed and built within their facility. Um, so 2019, just before this uh, lockdown craziness and the pandemic, uh, I presented the cross-industry innovation talk and the innovation journey of Jordan Ahli Bank and Ahli Fintech and what we did. And it was amazing to me to see how globally relevant technologies and innovations coming out of the Middle East and coming out of Jordan are truly uh, uh, globally relevant. And it was amazing to see, to me, to see how uh, the, the giants of innovation across the world saw what we did in, in Jordan as something they can make use of and borrow and something they've never seen. I'll, I'll try to tell you a bit of what we did in our journey as part of, the, of what I'm presenting today, but our focus is on the thought process 
and how you think of the future of banking, not necessarily what we did in our organization. One thing we focused on in NASA, and I loved uh, this as a takeaway, and I would like to share it, is uh, adopting a 10x mindset versus a 10% mindset. And this is a clear, um, we set a clear camp between us. So we tell people, uh, is this a 10x model or a 10% model? And by that, just to simplify it, usually in corporates, uh, we look at an increment of 10% year to year, maybe 20% max. But if, you're, uh, if your board comes to you and says, we want you to grow 10x in a year or a couple of years, so 1,000%, that automatically means you have to rethink your model. You have to question the basics. And uh, just like Elon Musk uh, calls this the, the first principle thinking, you go ahead and uh, restructure or disrupt the whole basis of how you operate and rethink this model. And that is the 10x model. How, how can you become 10x if you do business anew, as usual and you think linearly of how you can adapt side by side? The group at NASA, we developed friendships and uh, we became a, an amazing group together. So early this year with the pandemic taking place, we connected together as a group, around uh, 200 of us uh, collectively. So the, the four years all together. And uh, we uh, across a couple of weeks, we sat down together on Zoom, Slack, and what have you. We had a, an amazing format whereby uh, we developed a report helping people to think with a call to action, helping people to think, how can we address the new realities posed by the COVID-19? And it's a, it's a theoretical framework along with a call to action for people to sign up and decide to uh, adopt this think thought process and think towards this never uh, normal uh, model. And ideally, we developed ourselves under the NASA umbrella as a group called the Cross Innovation Strategy Group. This report, The Never Normal, is available for download at uh, crossinnovation.org. And I urge you, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting piece of information, a piece of uh, uh, very interesting document for you with interesting uh, information uh, uh, to explore. And mainly, uh, it looks at what, does, what the pandemic made us rethink and how this accelerated the digital adoption. So again, going back to this, uh, it made me think twice about the just because it worked in the past. Sometimes I remembered sometimes that I my main focus is to go out and uh, push this message as a, as a communication uh, uh, expert, if you may. So uh, maybe my focus should focus more a bit a bit more on communication more than the, the content itself of helping people think of uh, disruption and changing until this pandemic came in. And all of a sudden, uh, everything we used to talk about and try to convince people, now it became the norm. And everyone was shifting organizations. Uh, so uh, in banks, for example, VPN is a sacred thing. It's, uh, it's maybe the ultimate sin to request having a VPN. And now you have all organizations working from home, all banking organizations working from home, connecting. And all of a sudden, all of this, those taboos became uh, acceptable. Uh, the FDA never approved uh, any type of uh, medication uh, within less than months and maybe sometimes years. And all of a sudden, they started approving stuff within 24 hours. And this makes you question humanity and uh, how we enjoy introducing controls versus uh, looking into uh, uh, when being under pressure, things can actually happen. And all of a sudden, those controls uh, are no longer in place. So this inspired me, especially that um, uh, I'm hoping everyone is feeling well and this safety uh, from pandemic uh, for yourselves and your well-being and your families and what have you. Uh, but if you've heard, uh, we've uh, we've been entering something similar to a wave two, maybe it's still our wave one in Jordan. And this has enforced a, a number of uh, lockdowns and curfews. And uh, we're working from home but, uh, for the past, few months we've been under curfews during the weekends. And that made me think about a project that I have been keeping in the back of my mind for a while and uh, maybe push, putting it into action at last, which is basically writing my first book. 
And the reports, what happened with NASA, what's going on with the pandemic is not really the, the driver of what I mentioned in my, what, I'm talk, what I talk about in my book, but it focuses a bit more on what can you do within what's going on, uh, which I basically termed, described as the Hunger Games. So the, the, the book I launched uh, and it's expected to be released early uh, 2021 is called The Ab New Normal. And uh, it basically describes the, when the a state or the age of where the new normal is abnormal. The tagline is called how to evolve your mindset and business out of Hunger Games. And I talk within the book on, uh, I focus a bit more on helping your thought process. How would you adopt uh, faster, adapt and adopt faster uh, the technology enabling part, uh, especially with the fourth, fourth industrial revolution uh, components. How do you set your milestone, the, the, your milestones and the purpose and the mission towards, uh, especially the purpose, uh, towards uh, no longer thinking of those Hunger Games? And I describe, I use the term Hunger Games to describe the mass disruption that is going on and the down, down times. I've lived uh, eras of seeing the telecom uh, going through uh, disruption. They used to have their cash cow, SMS, and international phone calls. And then voice over IP came and killed the revenue from international for, uh, roaming and international phone calls. And then uh, WhatsApp came in and killed the revenue from SMS. I then moved to see this across banking, uh, retail early this year, so real estate and retail and malls and what have you. And then the pandemic came and made sure that every uh, fragile, I wouldn't say fragile, but every industry is ripe for disruption. And as long as disruption is ready, people automatically go back to the basics and uh, focus on uh, certain types of industries and business models that actually work. So why would you become a, a, an organization that is uh, about to play the Hunger Games uh, versus being a, a company like Zoom that grew 200x just by the mere fact of the, uh, the pandemic taking place. So going back into uh, the just because it worked in the past and focusing a bit more on the banking sector, and I start my analogy by asking you to name an industry that has a disruption immunity. Have you ever seen an industry that has never been disrupted and I have this uh, claim, uh, and I'm ready for anyone to challenge it, whereby I say no industry has disruption immunity, and I've never seen one, and I'm hoping uh, some uh, immunity can be built around disruption. And I'll be coming back to this word immunity because uh, some people, uh, some industries and people assume uh, they have this special magnetic, uh, magical shield to, uh, which makes them immune from disruption or change. And uh, I'm sure all of you have seen this slide that went viral many times and in many formats around Uber being the world's largest taxi company uh, and it owns no vehicles, Airbnb being the largest accommodation provider and it owns no real estate, Facebook being the, the most popular media provider and it creates no content, Instagram being the most photo uh, valuable photo company and sells no camera and uh, Netflix and Alibaba and what have you. But I want you to look into those uh, as examples, look into them in a different lens and try to, um, try to uh, conceptualize what's, what's different with those six companies. And I'll, I'll give you two main differences of why those companies were different. One is none of them existed 20 years ago. So those companies achieved the, the rank or the title of being the largest in something with, with zero assets or with very light uh, assets. And all of them are young companies. They are not uh, 100 plus companies. They were, they're were they all less than 20 year, years old. Some of them are even eight or nine years old as we speak. What's common with their business models or their thought process is a clear distinction between uh, what uh, the narrative today calls a scarcity versus abundance. And the scarcity business models all focus on uh, having a control over something that is scarce. So you either have a license or you own certain resources or have certain assets like taxi companies, for example, their, their, scarce, <coughs> their success <coughs> of their business model is around assets, the scarcity of the cars. The more cars they have, 
uh, they can defeat other uh, taxi companies with smaller fleets. The more taxis they have in the streets, the more successful they are. While when Uber came in, Uber uh, and, and the rivals of Uber, like Kareem and what have you, they came in with an abundant mindset. They said, our business model is based on abundance and we want to uh, help anyone become uh, a taxi driver using their assets. And our trick is using technology to manage this fleet. We, we no longer need to control and own the fleet. We only facilitate the connection of this fleet with the business model. And with that, abundance takes place, al-wafra in Arabic. So you have many, 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 many uh, tools and resources at your disposal, and your, your business model becomes successful with the network effect. The more you grow, the more successful you are, uh, but without having scarcity as part of the model. And uh, just to give you a clear example, again, there are many like, many examples like the Nokias and, and what have you, but uh, a special story to my heart is a blockbuster video story where in 2008, the, the, the year-end revenue was around $4 billion. So uh, Blockbuster had this uh, magical year. It was uh, one of their golden years, year 2008, where the revenue locked in as $4 billion. During, by the end of that year, they asked Jim Case, the CEO of Blockbuster, about Netflix, and he said neither Red Books nor uh, Netflix are even on the radar screen in terms of competition. And this was a, a very famous quote from, from Jim uh, uh, back then, uh, back in 2008. What happened one year later, so $4 billion of revenue, 2008, he says a statement by end of the year. One year later, 2009, mm. Blockbuster closing down. Everything must go. Everything reduced, closing down. And we remember this as a, as a famous story, but I want to look at it from a bit of a different lens. We all know how Netflix skyrocketed while Blockbuster uh, got bankrupt. So uh, uh, to connect the story with, with uh, the future of banking, I'm building on an analogy from my dear friend, Alex Osterwalder, who is the guy behind the business model generation. If you haven't uh, been introduced to Alex and his work, Alex uh, uh, coined the term business model canvas and the business model generation through his first book, The Business Model uh, Generation then had another book called The Value Proposition Design. There's many stuff, many, he has many interventions, uh, designs and templates and canvases. Very recently, he launched a new book called The Invincible Company. Uh, and uh, I've done many in interventions with uh, Alex across the years, uh, be it in Saudi Arabia or in mm -hmm. Jordan or what have you. And we've done uh, many workshops together and uh, retreats and what have you. So uh, I'm using his analogy for everyone to understand what the bank's business model is before we start looking into the future and what, uh, what that uh, uh, holds to us. So um, uh, if we look simply at a business model of a bank, and all banks follow this business model, no matter how large or small or what have you. So our value proposition in banks is simply we provide two solutions or, or two folds of our value proposition. We have deposit solutions, which are available at uh, lower interest. And we have credit solutions, which we provide at higher interest. So we personal loans, housing loans, and what have you. And that's mainly our value proposition. Our customer segment are uh, depositors and borrowers. Depositors are usually banked, be it personal individuals or companies. Uh, borrowers are banked and unbanked, personal and company. In the case of microfinance institutions, they provide borrowing services for uh, the unbanked. Revenue streams are either interest income, fee income, when we charge for transactions, or investment returns. And if you look at simply the business model, this has been the same banking business model since the year 1472, the creation of banking. Uh, the channels were different. We used to do it on paper. You used to have your own ledger, your uh, your uh, account book. Uh, and now we moved into uh, mobile apps and uh, different channels and, and what have you. Uh, today, you run everything you need to do on your, on your phone easily. And uh, uh, that basically uh, represents 
a, a, a shift in the channel, but it's the same business model. So I, uh, four years ago, when I started looking into the future of banking, I started asking this question. What if we have a block, blockbuster rerun? What happens if, what happens with blockbuster uh, happens again? And uh, the quick response I started receiving from banks was that banks are immune. We have license, uh, we have a banking license, the central bank, the model of the, the, the economical uh, banking structure or uh, narrative is built around issuing licenses for banks, which makes them uh, immune. And even if the, the immunity is not based on licenses, and again, that's, if you remember what we said earlier, that's a, a, a scarce versus abundance type of thinking. So if, if license is what protects me or uh, the scarcity of uh, assets and, and uh, resources, then I'm thinking uh, in a scarce approach, not in an abundant approach. Another uh, uh, challenging uh, <laughs> remark, if you may, towards the future of banking came back and said that everyone trusts banks. And uh, that's one of the main values within banks that people trust those banks and we provide them with our money. Uh, so you can't take that away uh, from the business model. And I started asking questions across the banks. What if, God forbid, mm -hmm. your ATM network goes down for four hours? Will your customers really trust you? What if your mobile bank, God forbid, has a leak or a privacy concern, a, a security leak or a, or a privacy concern came out on a certain bank? Will people really trust you? So the, the 1472-year mindset of banks uh, being trustable and being immune uh, is no longer the case, which begs the question, uh, are we ready to shift and uh, sometimes we started asking uh, if, if banks' operation today is fine and if uh, banks are really uh, sometimes some of the top performers uh, as an industry, the financial solutions within uh, financial sector within the, the GDP bracket in most of the countries, especially Europe and the US, uh, represents a healthy uh, chunk of the GDP and the contribution to the GDP which is also uh, questionable and I can have, I'm ready to have discussions around that uh, at a later stage offline. But if, if <clears throat> would you fix it? Do you have to fix it if it ain't broken? Isn't disrupting ourselves crazy? Some of the questions I heard. And that of course is the main question from what I call the immunity system, which tries to attack the change. And uh, every time uh, uh, you try to enforce uh, a mindset around the future of banking or uh, business model innovation and what have you, a uh, mothership, the core bank, comes in and says, uh, which of course is an immunity uh, attack, and it says, isn't disrupting uh, ourselves crazy? It's working. We have money, we have revenue. Why would you disrupt yourself? And uh, if you go back to uh, analyzing why immunity systems operate, uh, there's this uh, part of the brain called the amygdala. And it, it basically is responsible for uh, processing fear. Uh, and it's uh, if, um, just for you to quickly understand what's, what, what, who, who plays with your uh, amygdala, who, who controls your amygdala. Uh, if you notice, if you try to look at uh, news uh, sources, news agencies, most of the news is about uh, challenges, terror, uh, war, uh, catastrophes, mm. and that's basically the main thing that shows on every uh, headline of news that captures attention. Why? Because the amygdala automatically takes over your brain because of fear, and you try to understand, fear drives you, you try to understand what wrong is going on. Let me make sure I know what is going on if it's wrong, so that I can, uh, and it's a primal uh, instinct, uh, approach so that you can survive. Uh, so immunity, basically, immunity in organizations, especially banks, starts with this amygdala fight. And uh, automatically there's fear. What if it doesn't work? What if it goes wrong? And then uh, there was this phase where we decided as banks that we don't want to go through disruption up to the point where fintechs came up. Uh, and um, I'm assuming everyone knows 
how uh, why the fintech uh, term came up so the financial technology companies and uh, the question earlier on was are they really uh, disrupting banking or are they simply jumping at, at the fringes are they simply playing a bit with the payment side um, lending side uh, investment side but none of them are really hitting core banking so do we have to really worry about them that was the main question uh, for banks and uh, again they use the same narrative of uh, fear uh, fighting back and what have you so uh, do you really look at uh, fintechs as uh, valuable partners for the future or do you really uh, fight them back and I, I i remember having this discussion when we formed the the innovation group at our bank uh, and and we started thinking so why not uh, why not beat them in their own game why not become a fintech why not join forces with all fintech companies and of course that automatically means creating open banking uh, creating your own sandbox environment uh, bringing them on board and that's how we created the ahli fintech uh, accelerator and uh, uh, company so uh, fintech was initially uh, an enemy if you may or um, a disruption force of banks and then all of a sudden a new term came up and we started seeing tech fins and uh, tech fins by definition are technology first companies that can offer uh, financial services, uh, even next level financial services, but they have something special. They have masses of customers and they can trans easily transform customer experience. And those are, of course, if you haven't guessed, the Googles, Apples, Facebooks, and Amazon. So Facebook's initial attempt was Libra and uh, all central banks and the Congress asked them to, to shut it down. But of course, we know that they're building maybe something else that is that can maneuver around the regulation and make sure they have all the compliance requirements in place. Uh, uh, Apple had the Apple card and it disrupted how cards operate. Um, uh, Google did something with Citibank called Cash, uh, C-A-C-H-E, uh, and they're all stepping into this space. So the, the question started begging, uh, the, the question that uh, came um, to attention is, do we really uh, sit down as banks and play the hunger games or do we screw business as usual? And, and look into actually disrupting ourselves. So the whole narrative behind uh, people trust us, is it crazy to change, no longer makes sense because uh, tech fins are, fintechs started attacking at the, at the fringes, but then tech fins came in and they started taking over. And that basically bringing back my, my, my book uh, is, is the main narrative of uh, the thought process that I put into uh, my book, The App New Normal, because uh, the, the, the new normal now is abnormal and uh, uh, you cannot no longer, uh, uh, it's no longer an option for you to sit down and wait uh, and play the Hunger Games. Um, for you who, who now joined and uh, missed the initial part uh, of the session, uh, I have a special announcement, especially that I'm, I'm humbly proud of uh, launching my book is uh, basically, and, and that uh, that came as a request from the, the group at the, the speaker group of this conference, I decided to give away uh, free digital copies for everyone attending this session. So if you go to the uh, link abnewnormal.com and uh, use the special code Arab uh, MTech, you can use this to download, um, uh, to get a copy, a free digital copy of the book once it's out. Uh, which I expect uh, sometime early to 2021. Going back into the trends uh, of what drives uh, the banking sector, uh, one trend is today we are ready to leave our uh, wallets at home while we can never survive if we leave our phone at home. Why would you, as a bank, think of yourself as money in the wallet, not uh, 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 digit, uh, digital first, uh, phone uh, first uh, option, while people no longer have their wallets, uh, can easily leave their wallet at home, but can't leave their phone. That drives one of the trends. The second trend I called, I call the unconscious banking. It is, uh, we've all witnessed it a bit when we ride Uber cars today, uh, we arrive, we simply leave the car, and uh, something happens in the background. We have our card on file and, it, and the pa payment takes place. But uh, this is a simple trend today and I'm expecting this to grow big time in the future. We've seen payments on Alexa and what have you. 
And we've seen what Amazon did with Amazon Go and uh, the unconscious banking there means you go in, you don't stand in lines, you don't go through checkout, you simply pick up the stuff and leave. And uh, uh, Uber, uh, Amazon, those are all initial trends of unconscious banking that will grow and grow and grow in the future. So are we ready to adapt towards this new uh, future of banking? Uh, third trend I call the experience banking, and it's basically a question of value proposition. Uh, I asked that to my products team. If someone comes in and asks for a housing loan, do, re do they really want a housing loan or do they want to buy a house? And that completely changes the narrative. Is, is your service, uh, is your value proposition around and success around giving the customer the housing loan or actually helping him get the house? And it's completely, it completely changes the, the relationship. If someone comes to the bank asking for a credit card, do they want the credit card, really? Or are they really interested in traveling, so buying their ticket, paying their hotel, renting a car, and doing their shopping using the credit card? And that, again, means that the experience drives the value proposition a bit more than what hap what's happening today in terms of products and services within the banking. So this became an invitation for what I call the business model shift, what needs to happen to change business models in banks. And uh, I'm building an analogy here uh, around the, the, the bank's history. We basically, in banks, build infrastructures, so uh, whereby municipalities uh, build roads and bridges. We build uh, financial system infrastructure. And uh, what municipalities start to do is charge people in a toll booth. So it's a transaction-based business model. You show up at the toll uh, and you pay in cash. And that moved gradually from you paying uh, in person in cash up till uh, what happened in Dubai where RTA introduced uh, SALIC. So it became contactless and cashless. What I want you to clearly understand the difference between moving to contactless cashless while the toll booth is there. So that's the, the main business model, transaction-based. What RTA did is, or Salik, what Salik did is it made it contactless and cashless, but it's the same business model. There's a clear distinction that has to take place in banks where they, there is a mix between digitization and automation, which is what Salik did, contactless, cashless, versus innovation, business model innovation, and clearly adopting uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution tools <clears throat> to take you out of the current business model, which automatically, uh, in our term, meant, again, building the same analogy, uh, that uh, we uh, moved Ahli Bank into a shared prosperity ecosystem. And that's uh, a main driver of, of our strategy, whereby uh, we no longer build roads alone, which is the infrastructure. We also help build the ecosystem, a prosper ecosystem around us. So we help uh, different sectors uh, build around our main business model. And of course, that helps. Once they grow, we grow, and it's a win-win situation. This is a, a lengthy discussion, but we built it around a framework that we designed called the Shared Prosperity Organization Framework, which uh, no longer looks at the shareholder as the only uh, exclusive value creation um, entity. Mm -hmm. We have uh, eight, identified eight partners where everyone contributes value and receives value towards uh, meaningful progress. Uh, we designed a design thinking tool around it called the Shared Prosperity Organization Canvas, which helps you design tools in a shared prosperity manner. Again, this is not the scope of the discussion today, but I, but I wanted to mention this for you guys to know. And I'm, I'm super proud that Fortune has picked, uh, based on the shared prosperity model and, and our framework, has uh, selected the Jordan Ahli Bank to join uh, the Change the World list for 2020, making this a globally uh, relevant uh, model. So uh, Ahli Bank is now the first Arab organization to join the Fortune uh, Change the World list, making it one of four uh, among uh, the, the selected for this year, uh, four banks, so Bank of America, Royal Bank of Canada, African Bank, and Ahli Bank. Now, uh, one of the main uh, uh, points of, uh, or main uh, use cases of uh, how we built uh, uh, products and services around the shared prosperity model, which made us uh, basically uh, make it to the to the ranking and the index of the Change the World list at Fortune was a, <coughs> a platform that we launched called Anamine, and it's an AI and blockchain-based EKYC as a service platform 
today live in Jordan and soon uh, in, in some of the uh, adjacent uh, Arab countries. It's uh, basically, it went live on uh, during March, on uh, March 9th, whereby Ahli Bank uh, was the first to join this platform uh, as a sister uh, company. And by subscribing, Ahli Bank launched the first Jordanian instant bank account opening service, which helped us <coughs> basically provided the option of having all banking services with no exception while being at home. We have uh, two platforms, which I will be explaining, one called Mean World, which is the EKYC as a service platform, and Anamine, a verified digital identity app that you download on your mobile. Um, it, it, it was built around uh, uh, customer experience uh, being a challenge uh, during the onboarding. Uh, so there was many friction uh, drop-off points uh, at this area. And just to remember, so that we can quickly uh, understand the concepts, um, uh, basically, it is so built, it was built, this was built around the blockchain. And one of the main components I want you to focus on is the description of uh, the, the immutability uh, description of blockchain. So today, uh, the blockchain is not controlled by any single authority. Uh, it makes uh, the, the, which automatically makes it immutable, secure, transparent, and uh, decentralized. Immutability is one of the main key features that allowed us to build this model. Also, uh, the applications of deep learning today uh, uh, allows us to, to run face matching and recognition, check face liveness, detect tampered IDs. And uh, this was, again, proudly built and incubated at Ahli Fintech. So this is our own IP. It's the first live EKYC as a service platform in the Middle East. Uh, it's the second Middle East uh, KYC platform at large. Uh, before us, we had the UAE data sharing blockchain-based mm -hmm. uh, KYC consortium by Mashraq Bank and the IFC. Um, with Oracle, we're the first regional blockchain EKYC implementation and the first global blockchain Oracle cloud use case to move from the, the cloud to become an on-prem solution. Because of data sovereignty, uh, we agreed with the government of Jordan to move because of the data, the, the KYC data uh, sensitivity and data sovereignty, we agreed to move the platform off the cloud and onto local servers at uh, the bunker, uh, one of the data hosting facilities run by Zane in Jordan. So we became the first global blockchain Oracle implementation to move uh, on-prem seamlessly. Um, in September, we signed a strategic partnership with Zane, allowing them also to utilize the platform and um, I will quickly run you through what the what the program is, ending with a quick video of uh, Anamine. The platform starts, we have two apps, the Anamine, uh, we have two models. Anamine, the, the app, it's available for free on uh, Google Play and iPhone, and MeanWorld, which is a platform for uh, companies. The, process, the app targets uh, Jordanians for now, and very recently we will, have, we will be able to uh, accommodate 107 countries into this app launching hopefully before end of year. The process starts with you uploading your ID and detecting uh, <coughs> the app uses AI to detect fake and tampered uh, fraud IDs. Then it asks you to fill the, the unified KYC required data, your income, where you work, uh, uh, such data, followed by a request to upload supporting document like uh, proof of um, address and, and what have you. Also, the AI detects uh, the fake and tampered uh, IDs at that level. It asks you to upload a scanned inked uh, signature. So you sign four times, wet signature, and you scan this. Of course, the minute we have uh, a law that is, admiss that is admissible in court around digital signatures, we can simply remove this component, but today, we use the ink signature because we want this to be really admissible in court. Then once your data is up, you request to verify, and this initiates a video call with an Anamine agent. The Anamine agent technically does not have the power to verify you. The, his screen or her screen has a, an augmented reality uh, layer on top, which uh, runs in the background uh, uh, multiple AI checks so something around 700 checks take place within less than 0.2 seconds to match and verify this identity. So some of the things we test is liveness. Uh, we match uh, the, the face of the person in the video with the, uh, the, pic, the picture available on the ID and what have you. We run all those 
multiple tests in less than 0.2 seconds. And this allows, uh, this basically gives the flag for the agent to accept. The second step is we run in the background, we run background checks, compliance, and we build a risk profile to classify this, uh, this uh, person. We ask you to capture your signature again on camera. And uh, basically uh, what happens is the AI engine matches your signature that took place on camera with the four signatures you uploaded on the app uh, earlier. Again, this takes place uh, in no time. With that, we have uh, your uh, picture match. You are alive. Uh, your signature is matched and available on camera. We, the agent asks you to uh, uh, basically run, uh, they run, uh, they narrate some legal jargon to ensure that uh, you basically uh, agree to the terms and conditions and what have you. Once that happens, your enemy record is created or your digital ID is created. In the background, this gets replicated across the smart contracts is initiated and it creates a blockchain record and gets replicated across uh, the endorser nodes, which makes it securely immutable. Now you have an ID and you can do nothing <laughs> with the ID. What do you do with this ID is the second part, Alam Mean or Mean World. Mean World is our portal uh, platform that carries all the partner portals. Every partner that signs up with the portal gets tiered access uh, to, to the data of the customers uh, based on their classification. And uh, so if I want to join the platform as a, as a telecom, like Zane, for example, I don't get access to full EKYC data. I get only uh, access to data that is allowed by law. And uh, the process there starts by you entering, by the partner or organization, entering their national, the national ID of Rami, for example, to request KYC access. Once uh, uh, this is out, if I have an Anamine account, my app tells me Ahli Bank, for example, is trying to access your KYC record. If I am in agreement, I want Ahli Bank to access my KYC record, uh, I provide consent. So when the app asks me, do you authorize providing access? I say yes, and that provides consent, which automatically gives, uh, grants the data access of, the KY of my KYC data to the platform. This is GDPR compliant to ensure that uh, my data get, does not get exposed to any organization. I have to provide consent. And also the consent is included with the data cleansing. So if, uh, for example, my ID expires, the platform triggers me to run, to perform an update. I bring in my new ID. I run the verification again, and I push the update to uh, Mean World. Mean World automatically uh, uh, pushes this update to uh, the partner organizations connected to the platform before pushing again to become to make sure we're gdpr compliant before pushing i have the option of removing any of the partners so that if i don't want to push the update it's at my discretion it's uh, i have to provide the consent uh, we expose mean world under a very simple uh, portal that simply has uh, you enter the national id and the magic happens in the background or up to a full-fledged uh, API uh, platform, uh, API stack with queuing and what have you to build uh, experiences around the, the special, uh, whatever special model is required. This basically has multiple values. I'll run through them quickly. One is this removes the current KYC and onboarding challenge and friction point, allowing for a better uh, customer experience journey and provides the option of exponential growth capability for organization because I no longer want uh, need the customer to physically come visit me. They can do it at their house, uh, whatever. The second point is it brings shared prosperity through financial inclusion at the base of the pyramid. This is targeting telecoms, insurance, brokerages, uh, payment service providers, banks, and microfinance institutions, and what have you. Third, it allows through exponential technologies like AI and blockchain to create a better and much more secure KYC process than the current human-based KYC. And fourth, which is a very important point, it removes the redundancy from the customer having to perform multiple KYC checks and data cleansing across KYC-centric relationships with different business entities. Uh, the fifth point is it allows a national security intervention if uh, a certain uh, national security entity uh, notices, God forbid, a certain issue with uh, a certain KYC uh, account. Uh, they can simply see the level of um, uh, 
uh, exposure. So uh, KYC records and KYC activities connected to a certain account can be uh, visible and has a constant uh, uh, ability to intervene. So uh, with that, I would like to show you a quick video of the experience and uh, prepare your questions while we do that. And uh, before we end, a quick reminder, just because it worked in the past, and a quick reminder that uh, my book uh, launch is uh, happened and uh, expecting to be released early 2021. I'm giving away three digital copies for uh, people attending this conference. Use the special code and go to abnewnormal.com and use the special code Arab uh, MTEC to be part of the group that receives uh, a free digital copy uh, upon release. Um, thank you, and I uh, look forward uh, to your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Rami. Really impressive uh, presentation, great one. Uh, a lot of information, and uh, I'm yani, really very proud that yani, Jordan, my country, uh, having this great uh, innovative people, innovative uh, programs, application happening. Uh, uh, really, really great work. Uh, thank you so much, really. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, and I, I believe if there is any questions, please, uh, everyone, can you post it to the messages? I'm sorry, I wanted to schedule a bit more time for questions, but I think we, we only have uh, less than five minutes remaining. So if yeah. there are any questions, uh, I'd love to take them. Sure. Even we shared the. Uh, feedback form also to uh, have any question also you can assign it to Mr. Rami uh, name in the feedback form and uh, yeah so far I think there is no questions Good. I, <laughs> so fantastic uh, okay another one Let's see. 
the enemy is okay the question here the and uh, the anamine is super is yes of your yes, bank from the bank hello anamine is uh, if you remember during the presentation i described the shared prosperity model so we decided not to build this as a tool for the bank we built it as a platform today for jordan and uh, in the near future for uh, other arab countries as well and this allows Ahli Bank and other entities like Zain today and the, the, the two banks that already joined our, plo uh, our platform to make use of this uh, platform. Uh, today in Jordan, uh, using this platform is for free. Uh, entities uh, in Jordan get, uh, don't get charged. Uh, we have another business model around uh, doing this once we go uh, cross-border. Uh, because it's only for free for a couple of years. Uh, moving forward, we'll look into that. But uh, to, to answer your question, yes, it is a separate uh, entity. Uh, Ahli Fintech is a company owned by the bank, but it has a clear Chinese wall. So I signed an agreement with the bank to provide them with this service. It, it is not a tool of the bank. It's a separate tool. Um, and we implemented zero knowledge. Uh, so that uh, even I, as a, an administrator of the fund of the platform, I can't access the records. Uh, only uh, the entity can request access to a certain record. After the consent of the customer, they will get this access. Oh, I hope yeah. that covers the question. Yeah, uh, fantastic, really. Uh, so the platform will be online bank under the Jordan government. No, I don't think so. What do you think? No, it has nothing to do with the government. We support the government. Uh, we took this, um, uh, we had a discussion with all uh, uh, players in the space, so the Central Bank of Jordan, the Ministry of Interior, uh, many uh, people involved with the uh, KYC process. And what we built was uh, in support of uh, legal support, uh, basically, we built a framework that allows us to provide an outsource, know your customer or KYC uh, service, which is aligned with the Jordanian law. And uh, it's basically, uh, there is no such thing of as a, a license to provide the service. Uh, we, uh, and it's a, this is a very interesting question because we built this platform nine, nine months before the actual launch. But then it took us nine months with the legal team to make sure that it is legally compliant. And we built the legal documentation to support any or any entity that might question basically launching this service. Great. So uh, I believe, yeah, the, the platform is similar you know, under the regulations of the government itself. So if there is fully, another country, fully aligned, fully aligned. But it uh, and and all government entities uh, within this uh, scope, uh, blacks they they love us and they they uh, uh, they were looking forward for such a solution to be uh, to be in Jordan. Uh, so it abides by all Jordanian rules, of course. And we and designed it to be GDPR compliant, so that even when we go into other countries, it's also fully aligned. Nice. And if there is another country looking forward to use the same one. We, they need to align also with the local regulations, central banks, all of these we, things before we started. We looked, into, we looked into the 23 Arab countries and we are aligned with all of them. The only requirement we need is to change the KYC questions because not every country has the same questions. Mm -hmm. So we basically build, we'll, we'll need to build a, an adaptation of the, the, of the data, uh, not the process, the actual data uh, uh, to be aligned with the KYC requirements of the country. However, the process itself is uh, uh, is is, uh, is cross-border. We built it to be neutral and acceptable by all uh, countries. Great. And even the verification code will be changed, like the... Uh... No. Uh, phase two of the verification code, today the agent actually runs the call. Uh, phase two, and we decided to have the agent in place because we wanted to have this human element. Sometimes uh, you don't sit clearly behind the camera. Sometimes you can't put the signature properly and what have you. And now we will be moving to another phase where we have uh, basically early next year, where we have an avatar that actually runs this. 
So you don't need uh, di dialects and uh, there is no human intervention. There will be a human agent uh, to verify uh, what took place. Or if you can't deal with the, the avatar, then you click to request a human to support you. Fantastic. Really, we are proud of uh, what our uh, people and <laughs> from Jordan is happening and doing it. Really, uh, really great work. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rami. Sure. Really, Thank uh, you for the have you here. Uh, anyone have a question please redirect it directly to mr rami and the feedbacks and get the chance to get uh, his book really uh it sounds interested from the topics from the door from the vow uh the book itself and uh, looking forward looking forward for that thank you so much everyone uh, thank you. to the next session inshallah thank you bye-bye thank you